Welcome to Accelerating Drupal Commerce Adoption Through a New Commerce Kickstart. Um, I'm Ryan Zarama, the CEO of Centauro and the creator of Ubercart on Drupal 5 and 6 and then Drupal Commerce on Drupal 7, 8, and 9, which sounds more impressive than it is, right? Because really the ones for 5 and 6 are pretty similar and the ones for 8 and 9 are basically identical, but it's like five whole versions. <laughs> Um, and I'm presenting the work, you know, not of just myself, but of our team uh, at Centauro. And uh, that includes um, Jonathan Saxick, who's in Tel Aviv as our uh, commerce core lead developer, or what we would call our platform lead internally. And then our front end and site building leads, Ivan and Sunchitsa, who are working out of our office in Belgrade. Um, and we also just wanted to take a moment to remember and um, yeah, reflect on our colleagues who are traveling around Ukraine, um, making sure they don't get bombed. Um, so they were as instrumental to the success of this project as anybody else, and we, we thank them every day. Um, so as I prepared this presentation, um, I thought that it was kind of like a, like a title that I threw on the DrupalCon website without fully thinking it through. Um, because we knew like the, the, our desired outcome was to accelerate the growth of Drupal Commerce. But I didn't think like, but why? Like why does that matter? Like what's, what's the point of accelerating this particular project or Drupal in general? Um, and this was really what consumed a lot of our weekend at the Drupal Association board retreat is what, what would it look like to actually 10x the amount of innovation um, that, that takes place at Drupal Core. And similarly, what would it look like if we were able to 10x the amount of development and innovation in Drupal Commerce itself? But it's like, like is, it, is it just for the sake of the technology existing? Because I want to keep doing what I do for work for a few more years? Is that, is that the, like it's not, it's not satisfying. It's not an end unto itself. Um, but within Centauro, and for me personally, the reason uh, that, that we want Drupal Commerce to grow is because we, we actually believe that our vision for the future of e-commerce is better than the competing alternatives. Um, we think that our vision matters. We're, we're building a future where merchants go to market on their own terms, unconstrained by their commerce platforms, and from my standpoint, more importantly, empowered to do what's right by their customers. So this obviously puts us in distinction against the typical proprietary platform uh, that, that has a fixed roadmap, closed support, maybe no insight or influence whatsoever on the development of the product, and merchants are trapped and not able to innovate when they need to. And one of my, my favorite examples of what you can do when you don't have constraints um, comes from one of our most successful customers, EC Barton and Company, or HomeOutlet.com. Uh, they launched with us on Drupal Commerce 2.x. It was after Vienna. I can't remember what year that was, 2018? So in 2019, we launched their store. We said, what's next? And we weren't really sure what they needed to do next for the platform, because they really just needed their stores to start using it and referring to it. And they said, well, we really want to nail down, like, buy online to pick up in-store and near-store deliveries. So within 50 miles or so radius, they have their own box trucks and can do LTL delivery to homes. Well, we talked to them and did it. Right? Like there was no, it wasn't a long process. They were able to contribute back features related to store location and so on. And then, like one month later, all their stores closed for, <laughs> for in person ordering because the pandemic, you know, theoretically was going to shut down retail traffic. And I was developing contingency plans like, all right, what do we do when this customer stops being able to pay their bills? And which other ones are not going to be able to continue to work with us? And instead, they, I think it was tripled that year, their online revenue. And then now they've tripled it again <laughs> the next year. And they're finding more ways to get more value out of that website. Things that I hadn't even thought about, like using their website, even for in-store credit card payments, to take advantage of Signified, which is their fraud prevention tool that um, can do risk analysis and actually insures credit card purchases. So like, like, like just the fact that, that we were able to just strategize together what's next for you that would make you a more resilient business, make you more effective at reaching your customers. They didn't have to wait for that to be added to the platform like every Squarespace customer had to since there was no real like store pickup stuff at first. 
although eventually my cafe got that sorted out. Um, so that's, that's, that's it. Like, like, I think that vision matters. People should be freed to innovate on their own schedule, on their own terms, and to meet their customers in their own unique way. And I think that they should treat their customers right. I, I don't think that they should accept the status quo of the Shopify's and other companies of the world that are data hungry and just shovel all the data they can into their own data lake so that one day they can compete against all of their best merchants, right, when Shopify becomes a marketplace like Amazon. Um, so that, that's the future that, that I think, you know, we should help people avoid. <laughs> so we think this vision matters, and that's what we mean when we say that we power commerce without compromise, and we invite you all to kind of build that future with us. So where is the Drupal Commerce project today? Um, right now, we're sitting at, I think, what's there on the screen, around 51,000 sites total between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, slash 9. And as with Drupal Core itself, we still have a majority, or, well, yeah, I actually don't know the numbers for Drupal Core, maybe half and half, but like we still have a significant percentage of our sites still running on Drupal 7. Um, but we are up to about 20,000 sites running on Drupal 8 and 9, uh, and seeing a pretty consistent four to 5,000 site uptick uh, every year, which is cool. Um, the project as a whole, like I said, powers about 50,000 sites. But what's crazy to me is, is just to think the scale, the sheer scale of the project. Like I, th I actually think I'm underestimating when I say that we power $4 billion of commerce a year because I know individual sites that could account for a quarter billion sites that I've worked on, which is incredible. Like the, the scale that you can achieve with Drupal Commerce running on some of the modern passes, you know, that one in particular, running on Acquia and just churning through, like we actually, we weren't able to uh, reach the peak of how many customers we could throw at that site. <laughs> we actually ran out of licensed, uh, you know, nodes in our, in our performance optimization tool before we reached the end of what we could do on that site. So we have individual customers running on Commerce 2 that sell upwards of 10,000 orders an hour at peak, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and, and we're able to do things like just use the core framework, its own caching systems, um, and then combine that with some progressive decoupling so you get the forms API and views out of the way of the rendering pipe for cart blocks and cart forms. And then eventually you can fully decouple checkout if you want to. Um, like those things are all supported by Drupal Commerce today. And those are the strategies that people are using to reach massive scale with Drupal Commerce. And when we think about the feature set at a glance, I know this is like <laughs> a very dense glance, but but I, but I include this slide just to illustrate the fact that like Drupal Commerce, it's not, it's not just like, you know, add an add to cart button to a note. Right? That, that actually was more or less the model of Ubercart, um, where I ported the OS Commerce feature set into nodes. So you could just add a SKU to a node and then turn that into an add to cart button and then purchase it with a different data model between carts and orders that made it really tricky to keep things all synced. We, we fixed some things in standardizing our um, entity relationship model. Um, and that includes things like, you know, distinguishing between products and product variations, having first class entities defined for attributes and attribute values instead of just using random field types added to a node type. Um, you know, full support for your entire order data model, which includes orders, order items, customer profiles, stored payment methods, log entries to track what happens to an order, payments to track the completed payments, although we will eventually expand the payment data model as well. That's coming up in Commerce 3. Um, full multi-currency support, multi-store support out of the box. You pair that with the Commerce Store Domain module, and suddenly we were able to build a multi-domain but single-site store for university to have different departments running their own what appeared to be custom instances of Drupal Commerce, but all powered by one application. So IT only had one application they had to maintain, one payment uh, uh, you know, vector they had to monitor, and now they're finding new ways to use that application throughout the university now that, that it's deployed for them. Um, add to cart buttons, multiple checkout flows, price lists, blah, blah, blah. It's all there. Um, and you know, all of these features are, you know, up in free modules on Drupal.org. Nothing's locked behind you know, a dual license model like you'll see in other platforms like this. It's just free for you to use and to give back to. And we do really appreciate all the contributions. I'm sure I mean, have people in here maintaining modules or contributed on Drupal.org. I know some folks that, I, that I've seen and talked to throughout the conference, yeah. So like, like, this is what we've done together. So like, like I love 
talking about the number, but it's not like Centauro did this or commerce guys before it. I mean, we probably we probably serve you know serviced a grand total of maybe five hundred merchants on Drupal over the course of our life. So now we're near the fifty thousand that's live. That's that's all of us building this together. Recent releases of Commerce Core continue thanks to Jonathan's efforts and thanks to various customers funding development in Core. Um, again, in partnership with Acquia on projects, in partnership with um, Blue Spark on other projects. Um, we're seeing money funneled toward improving the core capabilities of commerce. One of our largest customers is a company called IPC that uses Drupal Commerce to sell training uh, credits and uh, PDF downloads and books and things have sponsored a lot of work in the core of commerce and in the various contributor modules. So the features have added things like uh, multi-variation type support at the product level. This is a new feature where you can have you know, one product display page that sells either digital or physical copies of the same product using different product variation types because that's how you have to configure what is a licensed download versus what's the weight of a product. That's a kind of a configuration thing that previously required distinct PDPs. Um, order management features, including admin order comments, and we have a great patch in the queue right now for customer order comments and the ability to surface admin comments to customers on the front end, so that should be in 2.31. State transla uh, transition confirmation dialogue, so you can be like, are you sure you're ready to mark this order paid? Are you sure you're ready to go to fulfillment? But then it also gives you the ability in the confirmation form to add additional, you know, uh, form elements that, that might be custom to your workflow. So you can say yes and also capture the money because I'm ready to fulfill this and you just want to automate capture so the merchant can't screw it up. Because I've done that before where we had a merchant on Black Friday authorize about forty, fifty thousand dollars in fulfillments and not actually capture the funds. <laughs> Fortunately, authorizations last more than one day. We were able to recover the money on Monday. Um, and caveat, this was, I mean, this is so long ago. I mean, ancient history. We'd never make mistakes now. You know? <laughs> Um, we also have the commerce uh, email module, which lets you use the, uh, the user interface to configure uh, emails that get sent in reaction to different order events. Um, that was a new module that I developed for, oh, shoot, I, I guess it was for Kickstart. We had a customer use case, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, promotions with coupon validity dates. It used to be at the promotion level only, now it's at the coupon level as well, and you can combine offers. So you can offer free shipping plus 10% off. That's new in 2.28, I believe. And then finally, most recently, on the payment front, we've added Apple Pay support through our Braintree integration, Venmo support through our PayPal checkout integration. Um, PayPal's been great partners and sponsors of this development and other things throughout the commerce ecosystem. Unfortunately, they couldn't be with us here in Portland, but they were with us in Seattle, and they just love to see the energy that the Drupal community brings to commerce and obviously, you know, what's good for us and good for them. It's all kind of the same thing. Um, so then the question is, why commerce kickstart? Like, if Drupal commerce is already there and it already does all this stuff, like, why do we need a distribution? We actually thought we didn't for a while. <laughs> Um, you, you may recall, you know, Commerce Kickstart's uh, last release was for Drupal 7, uh, and Drupal 7's, uh, I guess, when was it released? 2011? Yeah, and then we released Commerce Kickstart, I think, in 2012. So there hasn't been a new, you know, major version of Commerce Kickstart since then. And, and we just weren't sure what Composer meant uh, for, for site building and development on Drupal 8 and Drupal 9. And so we, we, we teased out a few different things. Uh, at first, we thought, well, maybe Commerce Kickstart would become like a, just a composer.json builder. So we had a, a web interface where you could select the different projects you wanted to include, and we would spit out a composer.json file. And that was neat, but it was a novelty thing, and, and ultimately, like, it wasn't the kind of thing that, that we could see ourselves maintaining long term. And, and if, if every single merchant has like a unique composer.json, and their, their own unique way of managing config and all this stuff, like, then suddenly we, we lose the ability to, to take care of some upgrades for them. So for example, if you use our default config in the distribution and you haven't changed it, then I can, I can determine from just you know, an update hook, it's safe for me to re-import a configuration file so you get a new feature without breaking what you already have because I can guarantee that everything in the distribution works well together. So the, the, the reality is like new features are great in Commerce Core, but like features alone won't drive adoption, especially if people don't even know how to use them or know they exist. 
Uh, and so, so if, for example, it still requires a developer to type composer create projects and tar blah 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 to, to evaluate Drupal Commerce, then you know we're, we're necessarily limiting the number of people we could ever reach. Um, so a distribution can help us create a version of Drupal Commerce that's a great demo out of the box and then has a one-click install and simply test me, which we do right now. You just click a little Drupal Commerce demo button and boom, you have a site. You can log into it. You can see everything that Drupal Commerce has to offer. But without Kickstart to kind of bring it all together in a demo store, you'd be lost if you weren't already a Drupalist. Um, and so, you know, I, I ask myself, like, how can we double our user base faster? Because waiting another five years for 4,000 sites here and there to come on board just doesn't seem smart. <laughs> it's not satisfying, at the very least. Because again, like, we think our vision matters. We think that merchants should be able to go to market on their own terms and do what's right by their customers, which means protecting their data, protecting their PII, not annoying them, not, not selling their data off to third parties. Like, if I want more people to have that experience, then, you know, one option is to, as I said, increase the evaluation, uh, or, or, sorry, uh, decrease the cost of evaluating Drupal Commerce. But another thing is to create, like, a fixed target that says, hey, this, this package offers the feature set of Ubercart. And I have a way to translate, you know, Ubercart product types, attributes, and options into the Drupal Commerce paradigm. What if we could get 15,000 Ubercart users to migrate from Drupal 6 and 7 to Commerce 2 on Drupal 9? Or those 30,000 Drupal 7 Commerce sites, we want them to come over too. And uh, you know, several of our projects are those Drupal 7 migrations. I think we have one or two in the works right now that are actually Ubercart migrations. Uh, one of them selling you know, tens of millions of dollars at auctions <laughs> uh, annually. It's pretty incredible stuff. Uh, which means once a month their site just gets absolutely hammered, <laughs> which again, decoupling really helps a lot with that. Um, but, but we want to make it easier for those folks who've been doing business and built big successful businesses on Drupal Commerce to come forward. And then once they're here, to have just a clear path forward toward maintenance that's maybe never going to be as easy as you know staying with the latest version of Shopify or Big Commerce because it's SaaS and it's updated for you. But maybe we can make it a lot easier than it has been in the past. That's the goal. And obviously, Drupal Core is doing that itself uh, just by virtue of the way that, that our release cycles are managed now. Um, as long as we're keeping up with deprecations, then the updates are more or less automatic. I think uh, one of our largest European users, we had migrated from D8 to D9 or upgraded from D8 to D9 in a day, give or take, uh, which is pretty sweet. So at the end of the day, Commerce Kickstart did prove the idea that this can drive adoption. Um, I can think of two of the largest Drupal Commerce projects in the world that actually launched on Commerce Kickstart. So it, it really proved the concept, um, but there were some things wrong with it. We mixed up, for example, all of our default config with demo content. So if you wanted to take advantage of like our search interfaces or product display pages or taxonomy menus, well, you, you kind of were tied. You had to just install the full demo store, then go in and start to delete things, undo things. And we took over the menus in what I think was kind of an unhelpful way. So, so it, it, didn't, it wasn't perfect, but it proved the concept. 13,000 sites reporting in. Obviously, that's a mixture of demos versus live sites. But I still get leads today from people that are like, hey, I'm running Commerce Kickstart. I go look at their website, and sure enough, they even kept like the logo <laughs> and the fav icon, and, and here they are, still doing business eight years later. Which is pretty awesome that they were able to do that without having to just jump from Drupal to um, another platform. Um, so when we think about you know, Kickstart, it proved the concept, so we don't want to do it again. <laughs> uh, we actually just want to do better. We want to make sure that the problems that Commerce Kickstart created for developers and site builders aren't reproduced in the new version. Uh, and we want to have a tool that's, that's even better as a sales tool, as an evaluation tool um, at the same time. Um, so what's inside? Commerce Kickstart, um, or what we generally refer to as a distribution of Drupal, is a combination of things. If you, if you get a distribution, you're really getting Drupal core packaged together with an installation profile along with contributed themes or modules and configuration that ties it all together. So again, that's a lot of, a lot of moving parts, but it's core, installation profile, modules, themes, and config that tie it all together. In Drupal core, right, there are installation profiles. Does anybody know any of them? <laughs> Give me one. one. What was that? Standard, yes. That's what I normally use. 
Um, but yeah, they're, they're installation profiles in Drupal core. So this just adds one more to the application. And then I think, I think we use a patch. I'll, I'd have to look at the composer.json file again. But, but to just make the installation, or the installer go straight into installing Commerce Kickstart versus requiring it to be selected as one of the various options. But you have the installation profile, which takes over the full installation process. We created a custom admin theme by sub-theming Claro. Uh, to make sure that the installation and maintenance pages look great. Um, and it installs its own dependencies, adds steps to the installation process, uh, and then brings along with it some default configuration, which we put in different sub-modules, so you can just install the default configuration that you want, and then you can choose either to customize it and manage it as your own config, or to leave it alone, and in the future, uh, we'll be able to intelligently apply um, updates to those default configuration elements. We also have a default store theme called Belgrade, uh, for obvious reasons, you know, we have an office there. One of my co-founders in Centaro is Boyan Zivanovic, who's long one of the top contributors to Drupal. Um, he's now writing Go code because he wanted to change of pace. <laughs> uh, he had too much of me. Um, but no, he, uh, he's in Belgrade. Um, Minya, our engineering director, and our front-end site building team is there as well. Um, so it's an homage to where a lot of our magic happens. And it's an attractive, mobile-optimized, bootstrap-based theme um, that's really cool when you combine it with Layout Builder because there are modules in the Drupal ecosystem that let you do things like apply bootstrap classes uh, to the components in your layouts. So you're, you're giving the site builder really a, a lot of like, muscle to, to create nice landing pages, product display pages, and so on. And then finally, we have certified projects. So this is kind of us trialing out what, what does it mean um, to, to identify certain contributed modules in our ecosystem as trusted. They're, they're either maintained by us or by people that we know to the same degree of care as Commerce Core itself. So that means automated test coverage, that means documentation, responsible maintenance. Right? We, want, we want responsible disclosure of security vulnerabilities through the security team. We want to make sure that, um, that the documentation is current and up to date and that all of the modules that we would certify for Commerce Kickstart work well together. So you don't end up you know, adding a stock module that then breaks your stored locator module or something to that effect. And then it's all tied together by what's called a project template. Has anybody used a project template before? Yeah, perhaps you've heard of the Composer project template Drupal slash recommended project, which is the way to start a new Drupal 9 project, right? If you're, if you're just starting from scratch, I've used it for my own blog, used it for other sites as well. And the project template is basically just grabbing a composer.json file that's been registered with packages as a project template. So you type out that one command and you suddenly have a full uh, installation of Commerce Kickstart ready to be used. Um, I use ddev, so you then just have to change into the directory, type ddev config, enter, 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 ddev start, I could do it in my sleep, wait 30 seconds while mutagen syncs, boom, you're ready to go. Um, and then if you want to add the full demo store, oh shoot, do you have the demo store, uh, the demo module in yours already? Okay, again, not my machine. Uh, but, but then you just add an additional dependency. This is a Drupal slash commerce demo. And um, the, the reason we separated out the demo module from the installation profile itself was, you know, one, just a separation of concerns, but we don't want all the images and things being perpetually maintained in the code base of anybody who ever starts a project from Commerce Kickstart project. Again, the idea is for it to be both a demo tool and a development tool. So if you don't need the demo store, you just don't get it, and you don't have all that bloat and cruft in, in your, your code base. All right, we're going to do it live. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> oh, geez. Why does command tab not work on your machine, Tom? All right. Here we are. Um, so as I said, like once, once you uh, just install from the project template, Composer installs everything it finds. Uh, and in this case, that means uh, Drupal 9, the Commerce Kickstart installation profile, our Centaro, Cla Centaro Claro theme, um, the certified projects repository, and um, it's just kind of ready to go. <laughs> um, so it's going to do its installation, I hope. Oh, yes, okay. Thank goodness. And if you're curious to see what's inside um, the uh, certified projects repo, it's up on GitHub. We've registered it as what's called a meta package with packagist. Um, oh, geez. Oh, geez. Sorry, Tom. Don't look at his, his uh, TFA settings. Um, but but uh, it's, it's, you know, 
pretty simple to just look at it in the composer.json uh, file itself, but you can read in the readme there. Like, what are the certified projects? Which ones are we looking at including over time? Our technology partner integrations, these are people that actually directly fund and support the development of Drupal Commerce. We love them. Um, and then, you know, themes, et cetera, et cetera. And then, then kind of what's next on our roadmap? Modules that we've written that we want to finalize and then pull into being officially supported certified projects within Commerce Kickstarter. So that's where you'd find that information. And then if we go back to our installer, hey, it's almost done. You're not using, yeah, you are using Mutagen, right? No, okay, I was wondering why it was taking longer than on my machine. Shh. These new Macs, man. <laughs> All right, this is gonna take, uh, this is gonna be a little bit longer than I expected. All right, so then after it finishes installing all the modules, um, you know, you're just gonna do your basic site configuration like normal. Like normal. <laughs> I don't know, is it gonna fail on Symphony Mailer? Oh, okay. Tom, what's your one password password? Just holler it out. <laughs> password one, two, three. All right. Yeah, we don't need that. And so then you get to like the select feature step. And so this is where if you're installing Commerce Kickstart for a sales demo, you're more than likely just going to click that first check box, which is install all features with sam sample content. If you're starting a new project, you have you know, your options of starting features down below. And, and our hope really um, is for like our customers at the lower end of the market, so talking like projects that you know, maybe they have a few thousand dollar budget, but they could literally just grab Commerce Kickstart, we could install it for them, manage it for them if they, if they want us to in a hosting environment, and they could just install it and sell. Uh, we have customers like that. A former colleague of ours went to start a mountain bike suspension company in Switzerland. Uh, let's see if his website's live. And, um, and you'll notice, once we get into the actual um, installed version of Kickstart, that it looks pretty similar uh, to what you're about to see revealed. So, so this, this kind of a site, like he runs a very fine business, but he doesn't need a $50,000 e-commerce website. But he didn't want to just reach for some SaaS solution, one, because he, he likes us, he likes open source software, uh, and it's been a great relationship for several years now. So very happy. I'm just gonna do the full demo store right now, but you can see, you know, this, you know, the demo, demo configuration for physical products, um, licensed uh, file sales, uh, memberships using the commerce recurring module, the whole nine yards. All right, this one's probably gonna take a little bit longer, so. Um, so what it has to do is install all of the layout builder tools because Sunchitsa has given us the full layout builder integration, including a, you know an attractive home page that you'll see looks just like any e-commerce you know template that you'll find on uh, Shopify or elsewhere. Um, and then there's a variety of sub modules that it installs all of those different feature sub modules within Kickstart that just looks like importing default config. Uh, and then the final step is importing default content. Um, because we wanted to show like actual sample content. Uh, Minya gets on to me for it, but I did waste several hours one day writing fun project or product descriptions for everything. <laughs> uh, you know, including some short stories, novellas, and the like. Um, but uh, but that, that gets installed through the default content module. Um, this is a module that lets you basically create content, export it to YAML files that will then be imported whenever you just run the, the default content import post installation. Um, really cool module, not foolproof. Um, for example, it kind of falls apart with Layout Builder. Um, you know, we, we discovered uh, that it doesn't do things like sort, um, or use a predictable sort for importing media content. So then if you're referencing a, a media entity from uh, a slider on a homepage, for example, um, it's gonna reference by ID and that I, the numeric ID, not the UUID, so you end up with images being in the wrong place, uh, so we're, we're looking at how can we improve the default content module to have predictable installation or just to use UUIDs for everything, which is what it does elsewhere. So all of the product content imports just fine. Uh, there's just a, a handful of quirks on the homepage layout that differ from my local installation versus the sample ones we've done in other environments. Um, what else was difficult? Has anybody else worked with default content? Use that at all? No? I just, would you just prefer mig migrate or body? No? All right. 
Any, anyway, so Minya, do you recall like Soon Sheets has any any other principal complaints with default content, or is it just layout builder support, not using UUIDs? Oh no, UUIDs for everything. Yeah, okay. Hopefully, we didn't just lose our projector. How can you test what now? As in, like, right now? Uh, well, if you go to the Commerce Kickstart project page, <laughs> um, you can see that you just have to have Composer installed. And that's it. I mean, well, and or DDEV, or your local development environment tool of choice. Um, so it's just literally just three commands. Whoa, whoa, what just happened? Holy crap. Sorry, not my machine. Um, it literally just create the project, require the demo module, and go to town. That's it. Yeah. And then uh, we will be working with Simply Test Me to get this new version up on uh, simplytest.me ASAP. It still links to the previous version of um, the demo, com demo framework we had. So now that we're fully installed, uh, we have, yes, Woo! we made it. <laughs> Um, you know, we have, uh, again, just an attractive, you know, store template with, um, you know, heroes with sliders that can be edited and managed directly within Layout Builder. Um, you can do merchandising through your hero images. You can do merchandising through different product sliders. So we just offer, again, just a way to, you know, collect products, manually curate products into a homepage slider. Um, I don't believe that we're actually using views in here right now. We just kind of made this like a manual curation example. Um, but we do have um, uh, a full like search API example coming. There's just a, a, some idiosyncrasies around um, making sure that all the fields are properly defined, so you can build the search API index. You know that, that's a bit more complicated than just a, a basic um, you know catalog and slider presentation. And you know any of this is easily customizable just by going to the layout tab. Um, and finding, you know, again, I, I don't need to do a layout builder demo, but, you know, finding the region you want to adjust, you know, adjusting either the settings at the, uh, the region level or in the component level. Um, and again, combined with, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the module off the top of my head. It's like bootstrap layout styles or something to that effect. It lets you, you know, alter the styling of the different components using bootstrap classes. Um, so we have it just demoed both on the home page as a landing page example, uh, and then also on product display pages. So if we wanted to buy, uh, I don't know, a gigantic inflatable pink flamingo, um, you know, we can see it's, it's, and it's, it's not rocket science. It's just using Layout Builder to put the image on the left, the product descriptions on the right, get your taxonomy terms showing above the title nicely, all that stuff. But it also works with the Add to Cart form. It works with uh, Drupal Commerce's method of updating the different elements of the page as you choose your attributes, right? So, so an, an image might change, the price might change, the URL will, will update to show what variation you've selected. Um, and if you don't want Layout Builder, the Belgrade theme will degrade. So we have some graceful degradation um, so that we have defined in the theme a product template that we fall back to if Layout Builder doesn't exist. So you, so you at least have, you know, like a side-by-side -side image and content layout by default. Um, and I, I mean, if you've used Drupal Commerce before, the features aren't, uh, you know, going to be new to you, but uh, we're able to do things at the installation profile level like override module provided configuration files. So this is important because Commerce Core doesn't add like an image field to anything. But you don't often go to an e-commerce website with visual products and not see image thumbnails, you know, either in the cart block or on the cart form or embedded into the check. I guess I don't have them in the cart block. Embedded into the checkout process with a little summary. So we needed to be able to override this once we had defined that base field or the, well, I guess the bundle field um, in the installation profiles config. Um, so it was really cool that we were able to do that. I, I didn't know that I could do that until I tried doing it with a custom module first and it really complained at me. And then I just happened to move it into the uh, installation profiles config install folder and boom, it just worked. It's great. Um, but it's not without, you know, its risks. If, uh, if something upstream changed in the default configuration in that module, you're now responsible for incorporating those changes into your installation profile, you know, configuration. So just bear that in mind if you're doing the same thing on your site. Um, you know, this is just a standard Drupal Commerce checkout form. It's side by side by default, but themed prettily by Belgrade. 
I'm going to buy my flamingo and ship it to Tom. That's not Tom's actual address, but it'd be rad if it was. Um, you know, again, you know, shipping options, auto update as I'm entering my address information, so it's automatically recalculating as soon as it can. This is not a real credit card gateway, it's just a, you know, an example, example payment method for you to be able to use. Um, and that's it, you know, now I've, I've completed the checkout and purchased my gigantic flamingo. Sorry, it's not my machine. <laughs> I may have said that before, but um, we do ship with um, default uh, Symphony Mailer and DDEV MailHog configurations. You can just kind of enable that for local testing to see your email receipts or play around with commerce email or whatever. Um, and I, I actually don't know. Let's see if Yvonne's themed the order page. Many do you know? I have no idea. Let's see if this looks terrible or if he actually surprised me. Ha ha ha. Okay. Yeah, so he's even theme, you know, themed various parts of the um, account administration interface. So um, your, your order history pages, um, your, your stored payment methods, your address book, um, those elements are all kind of just, again, out of the box functionality of Drupal Commerce and accounted for, um, you know, by the theme itself. All right. I think that's probably all that's, you know, worth, you know, reviewing in the, in the installation profile. Obviously, you can install it yourself, play around. It's really easy to get started um, and, you know, delight yourself, you know, with the dozens of products that we have for sale in this store. Oh, one last thing, of course, because this is a new feature, is just the idea that um, if you're selling media content, you might want to have both the physical version of the, the, the book or CD or whatever it is that people still buy these days, along with the digital version. And so that's where uh, being able to reference variations of multiple types comes into play. Because in our variation type configuration for media products, we have to define what kind of license uh, does it sell? And in this case, the license that it sells is a file download. Um, you can, well, it's kind of small on the screen, but you can see that we are assigning, oh geez, let's go back, there we go. Um, when, we, when we configure this product variation type, we're assigning traits to it, such as provides a file download, uh, provides a license, and then these things get tied together because file is just a license type, um, and then I'm granted access to, to download um, that file after purchasing based on whatever terms I've set up. So I don't even know, I guess it's set up at the product variation level. Um, you know, we can see that I might have, you know, forever access um, to this particular file, uh, file download. Go to my carts, let's check out again. Um, because I've paid before, um, my, my cart on file is what we call in commerce to a stored payment method. So that's just a default um, setting for any payment gateway that supports it. In fact, it's our preference is to tokenize the payment card instrument immediately on the checkout form so that even when you complete checkout, um, it's just making a charge against a card on file in the gateway's vault or wh whatever they call it. It's Braintree's vault, I think, customer information manager and authorize.net. Um, in this case, this is just fake. So it's just, you know, using what, you know, my, my fake card on file. Um, because this is a digital only order, I'm not presented with the shipping options. So there are different checkout flows and which one is used is determined by the products on my order. Um, so we'll go to review, purchase it, and hope that it shows up in my file downloads section. Nope. Well, why not? Huh. huh. No clue. Um, that's a con default configuration fail. Um, but uh, w one of the things that's neat too about the fact that all of these you know, content entities are being created is you can combine uh, a standard Drupal Commerce installation with the group module. I don't know if there's any, any error message here or not. Nope, I'll have to figure it out later. But you can combine Drupal Commerce with the group module and then you use group to represent a B2B customer. So suddenly multiple user accounts can be tied into the same you know, entities within Drupal. So we have you know, one customer that uses the group module to define organizations with purchasers who are all part of that group that have access to shared address books, shared stored payment methods, shared order histories, file downloads, and the whole nine yards. I thought that was pretty cool, and I think that maybe in Commerce 3 we want to look at making a customer entity more of a core concept and not wholly outsource that to group, because group obviously brings a lot more to the table that can, you know, you know, may or not be what, uh, you know, any particular developer wants. So that's going to end the Let's Do It Live portion. We survived. <laughs> um.
So just to kind of like wrap up some of the lessons that we learned, first of all, if you're looking to build your own distribution or, or similar installation or what uh, you know, Dries referred to in his keynote as a starter kit or starter template for Drupal, check out our readme. Um, anytime that I hit a, a hairy problem, uh, I document it in there. Uh, I think we also have in contributing.md a few other things as well. But one example was we knew that our commerce demo module needed to be dependent on sub-modules of the installation profile. But the way that Drupal Packages works right now, it wouldn't resolve properly um, that, that installation profile dependency. It's just, it just wasn't sh not ready yet. Um, so Composer would break if you tried to add the Commerce Demo project to your, um, your, your Composer.json. Um, so we just defined it as a custom uh, repository. It's still served from Drupal.org. We just get it directly from VCS instead of you know, getting the packaged version. Um, I used that same trick recently uh, because we were using Asset Packagist within Commerce Kickstart. Um, Asset Packagist was basically a wrapper around NPM and Bower to fetch JavaScript assets and libraries to build into your code base using Composer. People liked it because of the convenience of having just one uh, tool to build all of your project dependencies, uh, but Asset Packagist disappeared. <laughs> uh, it went down for a full day, so if your build was dependent on that, you were hosed. Not only that, uh, and I, I need to double check, but, but when it came back online, there was an area mention of it. So will it go down again? Um, was this, you know, how was it resolved? The registrar was in Russia. How was that resolved? I don't know. So we switched from using asset packages to just defining custom repositories, basically our, our own package definitions in um, the, the Kickstart projects composer.json file. So you can do that. You can, you can literally build anything you want to into your project just by defining it as a package. You just lose version constraints and you know, automated updates to new versions of those assets. So um, a few other things. You know, we learned that um, you, know, you, you really should figure out how to separate your default configuration from your demo content so people aren't having to work against your starter template whenever they install it. Um, you want to mind your dependencies in your installation profile. There, there, there are two kinds of dependencies you can put in your .info.yaml file. Those that are actual dependencies and those that are optional but in pre-installed modules. So, so within Commerce, for example, I might put a dependency in Commerce Kickstart on the Commerce core module. But if I put a dependency on the Commerce tax module now, even if you're building a site that doesn't need tax, that module must be installed. And, and I like to reduce that footprint as much as possible. So you just make sure you're putting things in the right category. But even more important is not putting um, dependencies in your composer.json file for just optional modules you want to bundle in with the distribution. So like all of those Centaur certified projects, we put them in a meta package so that you could just remove that package entirely if you didn't want it. Um, or, and I, I kind of just bumped against this use case myself, for, for developers who may want to use a different version of a module you're including in your composer.json file, um, if, if you make that a, a, a dependency, a required dependency in your composer.json file at the 2.x branch, and they want to use the 3.x branch, well, they can't. Like if, if Commerce Kickstart installation profile has one dependency and they want to change it to something else, like they, they just can't unless they patch Commerce Kickstart or something else to allow it. So we use that meta package as just an abstraction layer. If they wanted to use, say, the new branch of Commerce shipping before we're ready to certify it for use, you can just remove the meta package from your project, so remove Centaro slash certified projects, and then just add back the individual projects that you want at whatever you know, version that you want them to be. So again, pr trying to prioritize developer flexibility, but still put a lot in the package to solve for that simple you know, store builder um, use case and or sales demo tool. Finally, like I said before, overriding module provided config files is great. You just got to manage it. Uh, and then layout builder is phenomenal. Um, but you know, if you are going to build your distribution around Layout Builder, everybody might not want it. Um, we have some customers that use um, Acquia Site Studio instead. They don't need what we have to offer from Layout Builder. But you can still bake some graceful degradation into your installation profile to make sure that it works with or without it. And I think uh, what's next is, is it. Okay, so um, next up for Commerce Kickstart, we'll have more recipes and more use cases supported by the default configuration out of the box. We'll also be splitting it into two flavors, full stack and headless. Um, some of our largest sites are fully decoupled projects that use the Commerce API module and or custom resources um, to power you know, pretty robust storefronts. Uh, and then we're also finishing up a store wizard and a go live checklist. 
So again, that's just so that we can deploy it to a server for somebody, point them at it, they can set their password and then go to town preparing their store to sell, and maybe they won't even need support from us. Who knows? That's how we will double our user base, I think. And thank you for being here and taking, all, you know, taking it all in. Appreciate it. All right, and we are more or less at time. I think these are 50 minute slots. I, I can field one or two questions and then I'm happy to make myself available for conversation afterwards. And if there are none, that's fine too. <laughs> yes? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I do not. Uh, and, you know, I'm still, still, you know, I, I have a pull request I need to pull in. <laughs> um, but obviously, like, you know, to be honest, um, uh, in, in many respects, I'm a, I'm a builder, not necessarily like an infrastructure decision maker. So I will, I will follow Drupal cores or the Drupal project's lead. And if that's, you know, the, you know, whatever the best practice is, that's what we'll implement, basically. Oh, no. I, I'm, no, that's not what I was saying. <laughs> I, I've always been a strong advocate for the GPL and for free software, and, and I'm and I, you know, more than happy to do what the Drupal project does to make sure that, that we're compliant and, and you know, advocating for best practices. But I, I literally just did this like three days ago, and then I flew to Portland, so we'll, we'll figure, we'll, we'll keep iterating. <laughs> any, other pro, any other questions or? Uh, yeah. 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 The the question was: Is Drupal Commerce ready to be used in fully decoupled contexts? Yep. Um, we have a case study that we've shared before at DrupalCon Amsterdam for MatSmart. Um, they're they're one of our largest customers. They're based in Sweden. Um, and their website started out as a full stack uh, Drupal 7 project. Um, and uh, over time, as their business did well, they, you know, they, they raised multiple rounds of venture capital. They've grown uh, to expand from beyond Sweden into Finland, um, Germany, Denmark. Um, this site, in order to keep up with, uh, oh, geez, Any, anyone? We're going to go with God can Kekor. All right. Woo. All right, I guess right. Um, you know, our, first we had to um, just make it scale as a full stack Drupal 7 Commerce One X project, which meant, um, you know, say changing your transaction isolation level if you've ever had entity deadlocks. And then we had to begin decoupling individual elements, so like using a JavaScript template to build the uh, shopping cart block and the cart form instead of using views and the forms API completely. And then finally, fully decoupling. So this is just a React application. Um, and the back end now is completely decoupled, which then is great for expanding in the new markets um, because we can just replicate that back end, relaunch that front end, and we're able to kind of like piecemeal our way toward it. So like the same front end was being powered by both Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 back ends until we got them all up to date on Drupal 9. Uh, so it, was, it was a really cool use case. We, we've done smaller things as well, like just React applications embedded into university portals so they could drive uh, alumni engagement and, and raise money for the universities. Um, and, you know, numerous other use cases besides. Yeah. yeah, thanks for the question. All right, let's wrap it up there, and I'm happy to chat more if anybody has any other questions about the project in general.